So, uh, welcome to our second week of lectures. Uh, as our first speaker, uh, we have the pleasure to introduce Jay Sketz. Jay Sketz uh, obtained his PhD in 2007 at uh, the University of Wisconsin under Ken Ono, and he holds a position as Associate Professor at Duke University, but is currently visiting Hostech in South Korea. So his lecture series is entitled New Avenues for the Circular Method. Okay, thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Lillian. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, present this. Um, and I hope that uh, no, it will give some, uh, as a, the title says, it will give some new avenues and some new things to think about uh, regarding the circle method. Um, there's going to be two sort of, uh, topics in the series of lectures. Um, the first one is this Adele accept, um, Delta symbol method. The second one is going to be for, focused more on the program of Braverman and Kajdan and non abelian extensions of Poisson summation. Um, but let's just focus on what we're doing today. So today the goals are to explain an idyllic delta symbol method. Uh, to state some applications. basically just to quadratic forms, although there's other things that you can do. Um, but really an ulterior motive, well, okay, let me. And I'd like to state a conjectural generalization that I think would be really fun to work out. Um, but one ulterior motive today is, I mean, this is a summer school, I'd like to review the uh, relationship between classical and idyllic Poisson summation. Um, and I, I think just sort of, this is going to come up again in the other lectures. And I, I think it's just useful to nail these things down in this setting. Um, I also invite you to interrupt and ask questions um, as I go. And I probably will not be following the chat, but uh, the um, moderators so far have done a great job of letting the speakers know what's going on in the chat. So um, you know, I don't think that's going to be an issue. All right. So let me start with the classical delta symbol method. Right. And I mean, there's actually several sort of contenders for delta symbol methods that are um, discussed now. There's sort of a elementary one, and there's one that I think um, Munshi is going to speak about that um, is a little bit more sophisticated. So this is the one that sort of follows Duke Friedlander and Ivanić um, and Heath Brown. So, um, so I'm going to let B be n copies of the additive group. So BQ is just Q to the n, and B of the real numbers is just R to the n, right? I'm gonna let delta from R bigger than zero to VR be the diagonal map. So I'm just gonna use this to decide what the sides of vectors are. Um, I'm going to give myself a Schwartz function. I'm gonna write F sub infinity for now. Um, the reason for that will become clear later. So this is just a usual Schwartz function. And you know, as, as we all know, I mean, what is one goal of the circle method? One goal of the circle method is to study the behavior of functions 
of the following form. So I take nx to be the sum over c in dz of f infinity c over delta x um, as x goes to infinity. Um, I don't want pc to be equal to zero. Okay. Um, all right, and here p is some polynomial, x1 to xn, say with integral coefficients. All right, so, I mean, how do we think about this? Well, from the point of view of the delta symbol, the first step in this to do is to do this sort of dumb thing, which is to rewrite as the sum over C in DZ of delta P C F infinity C over delta X. Um, where, as usual, delta M is just this uh, Kronecker symbol. Delta M is one if M equals zero and zero otherwise. Okay, so how do we estimate this thing? Well, there's a knee-jerk reaction that one has, which is to apply Poisson summation. Now, of course, you can't do this, right? Because the um, this distribution uh, that is isolated around delta p is not going to give you some smooth function. So how do you deal with the fact that this distribution uh, that's isolated along the zero set of delta, uh, sorry, p is not smooth? You can give a smooth approximation to it. So the problem is that delta p x c f x c over delta x is not smooth. So you try to obtain a smooth approximation. Right? So one solution to this problem of finding this smooth approximation um, is due to Duke Friedlander, Fonich, and Heath Brown. And I'm going to sort of um, phrase it slightly differently than they do, but um, I think you'll be able to see where it's coming from. And the basic idea is to uh, approximate this delta pxc by smooth functions. All right? And the idea for doing this is actually, frankly, it's so stupid that it's, it's amazing that it actually gives you anything useful, um, this, this silly idea that this, um, that this actually works. So it's one of these elementary ideas. It's just um, it's sort of amazing that uh, something like this actually gives you something. Um, so I'm going to give myself a smooth test function in two variables. Um, I'm going to assume that phi of t0 is equal to 0 for all t and r and that if I take the Fourier transform in the second variable of this thing, then it's not equal to zero. So this is Fourier transform in second variable, right? So the claim is that for Q sufficiently large, this delta symbol is C Q phi over Q times the sum over D in Z minus zero of phi 
uh, M over D Q over Q minus P D over Q M D Q. Right? And here CQ phi is one over F2 phi zero zero plus O M D Q to the negative M. Right. And I've set this up slightly differently than the way Heath Brown sets it up. So there's, I mean, the power of Q might be not exactly the same as what you're used to if you've seen this before. Um, and the proof is, is so simple that it's just, I mean, there's no reason not to give it. Um, so what do you do? Well, you observe that if you take the sum over Z, they're not zero. P M over D Q, uh, D over Q, subtract P of D over Q, M over D Q, right? Then this is equal to zero if M is not equal to zero and it's the sum over D and Z of phi zero d over q if m is equal to zero. And I mean, the way you see this is you just change variables in whichever sum you like, uh, change variables d goes to what do I want to do? Um, m times d inverse, and then you, you see this immediately. Right? Jace, if that is sigma instead of a phi in the last line. Sigma instead of a phi in the last a line. Summation. Oh, goodness, thank you, thank you. Zero and then thank you. Um, right, and I mean the reason that I can add a d at zero here is because of one of my assumptions over here. So then you just use Poisson summation to estimate this last sum. And that's it. So I'm gonna give the same proof two more times in this talk, but I mean, it's, it's sort of silly. I mean, it's um, the amazing thing is this actually, you know, gets you something. And, you know, I, I'm probably uh, a lot in the audience uh, know this better than I do, but um, let me just remark that why is this useful? Well, it allows you to detect, sorry, this thing keeps on coming up. Um, it allows you to detect the occurrence of m equals zero in um, a set of length x um, using moduli uh, d of size square root x, right? And this, I'm just taking q to be um, square root x here. Jace, the, the yep. question, and there's a question uh, uh, yeah. about the proof. There is yeah. one supposed to be over divisors d of m, and if not, why? Um, yes, yes, yes. I have to, have to take the sum over divisors. So divisors d of m. Um, right. Um, so I need to take the sum over d dividing m getting ahead of myself with this, so. Um, all right, um, thank you. Okay, so, um, so what are the applications of this? Um, well, I mean, as sort of a, a test case for this sort of thing, um, Let's look at the case where p is equal to a quadratic form. Um, then there's a theorem of Heath Brown. Uh, it says if you have n, remember n is the number of variables, uh, is bigger than or equal to four, then nx is cx the n minus two plus 
some little O term that's O X to the N minus one plus um, some beta over two plus epsilon, right? And there's also, he also obtains results for N equal three and four that involves some log X term. And the proof uh, essentially is just to apply the delta symbol plus Poisson summation in B and then estimate. Okay. Okay. Um, so it, as an application of the, the Adelic delta symbol that I'm going to talk about um, later on the talk, if n is even and n is bigger than four, I, I later showed that there's a secondary term for this. So C1x to the n minus two, C2x n over two plus some O of X n over two minus one plus epsilon. And of course, I mean, the, the constant depends on what function F infinity you're taking and then epsilon and P. Um, and then my student Thomas Tran and his, his thesis proved that if N is odd, then you get an analogous um, Estimate nx is c1 x n minus two plus c2 x n minus one over two plus o n over two plus epsilon minus one. Okay, um, and there's only sort of one. I mean, at least in this setting, because we're working over q, uh, there's only one additional thing, which I mean, Heath Brown sort of does too, which is well, you apply the delta symbol method. Um, you do Poisson summation in V, and then you do melanin version. In D, All right? So maybe I'll, I'll pass back up here just for a moment to say what, what I mean by I mean, up here in our delta symbol, we had this D sum. So when you apply Poisson summation, you're going to be taking um, Poisson summation over the vector space, which is essentially going to tell you something about um, this M factor here. Um, and then after that process, you end up with something that it, it turns out you can analyze using a melanin version in D. And it turns out to be something that's essentially a product of Dirichlet L functions. So you can get pretty good estimates on it. Right? All right. So in this setting, I mean, we also have, um, there's also analogs. For the boundary cases, n equals four and three. I don't really want to discuss it at this point. I mean, you just get some extra um, logs that come in here. Okay. So actually, the the work that um, that Thomas does, and well, Thomas works over Q, but the work that I did um, was valid over uniformly over any number field. And the way that you get something like this to work, or one way, is to apply um, what what you might call an adelic delta symbol. So let's talk about that next. And I'm going to spend some time um, reviewing uh, sort of, um, let me back to call it Adelic recollection, recollections. Um, easy for me to say. Um, so F is going to be a number field. All right. And I'm just going to um, recall for you the, the places of F, I mean, they're equivalence classes of valuations, but for all intents and purposes, you can take this for the definition. They're in bijection with a set of infinite places. So this is infinite places. So they're embeddings of the number field into C mod conjugation, 
by which I mean complex conjugation, union, the primes of the ring of integers. Okay, so over Q, you just have one infinite place and then you have the, all of the primes. And you write FV, so V is a place. You write it to be FP, the piatic completion. If V is a place attached to a prime, R, if iota or a map from F into C lands in R, and this is called a real place then, or C, if iota from F to C um, does not land in C, is not. Not contained in C. And for each one of these places, you have a valuation. So this is the piatic norm. If B is equal to um, a place attached to a finite prime, um, it's the usual norm. Excuse me, not content. Ah, uh, sorry. Thank you for whoever. Oh, hold on. Okay. Okay. Um, somebody in the chat posted that up. So it's the usual norm if um, FV is equal to R. And just to make things confusing, it's um, Z squared, it's uh, Z, Z bar if uh, FV is equal to C. So it sends Z to Z, Z bar. It's the square of the usual norm. Okay. Um, and for finite V, OV is the set of X in FV such that XV is less than or equal to one. And OV times is the set of X in FV such that XV is equal to one. Okay. All right. So if you take any characteristic, um, any local field, so all local fields of characteristic zero are among the FV. So if you like, I mean, you can take that to be the, I mean, this isn't probably the most invariant definition, but you can almost take this to be a definition of the local field of characteristic zero. It's a completion at some place of some number field. So something that's kind of fun and motivates the uh, normalization of the complex place is that the art and product formula holds. Which is that if you take the product over all places of X, V, it's equal to one for X in F times, and I'm embedding X, it's an element of F times, I embed it diagonally into all of the um, completions. And since this is a summer school, if you want, you can say an exercise proof for F equals Q. And if, once you see it for F equals Q, then you'll sort of be convinced that this is the, the right thing, all right? So this is, um, so let's go a little bit further. Um, for each one of these local fields, we have a notion of a Fourier analysis. So every FV has a short space um, S of FV and a Fourier transform FV. that just like in the classical setting, it extends to L2 FB. It's unitary if you normalize things appropriately. All right, so let's be more precise about this. Um, so for V dividing infinity, so this is just a, another way of saying that V is a, um, a real or a complex place. Uh, SFB is the usual thing. 
And the Fourier transform is the usual thing. Um, for V not dividing infinity, um, the thing I like to say is that the arithmetic is harder, but the analysis is easier. In this setting, the short space is just compactly supported. locally constant functions f from fv to c. And so in particular, you don't have this Heisenberg uncertainty principle nonsense, compactly supported function at its Fourier transform is again compactly supported in this setting. Um, so as a example, if I look just at the short space of QP, it's actually equal to, well, I gotta put spans here. It's equal to the span of the characteristic functions of A plus PK ZP for A in Q and K bigger than or equal to zero. So you can um, take these things, take their span and you're going to get, uh, I mean, they're not linearly independent, but if you, you can write any, um, element of the short space is some finite linear combination of these things, right? So the moral is, is that the finite short spaces record congruence conditions. Right? So that's all that these, these finite short spaces, uh, you know, that's all that they're doing. All right. So let's define um, the Fourier transform in this setting. Um, so let's just recall that you have a duality between continuous characters, Fv to C times, and Fv that sends an alpha to the character that is x maps to psi of x, alpha x, where psi is any non-trivial character. Okay, so let's construct some, and let's construct some non-trivial characters. I mean, this is just uh, a special case of Pontryagin duality. So the Schwartz mean analytic or C infinity. Schwartz does not mean analytic. It does not, it, it means that uh, it, it means that it's a compactly supported smooth, so rapidly decreasing as you go off to infinity in the usual sense and all of its derivatives. So not analytic. Okay. Um, Okay, and I apologize if I missed something in chat. Um, so if I take for f equals q, um, psi infinity, I mean, you have a choice, of course, but I mean, one nice one is to take it to, oh, I have, uh, get rid of that, two pi i x. So that's one, so there's a negative here negative two pi i x and psi p of x equal p two pi i principal part at p of x where um, principal part at p of x is some element of z p inverse such that um, x minus principal part at x is an element of zp, right? Okay, so what I'm claiming is that these things, so this is, so psi infinity is a non-trivial character from r to c times, and psi p is a non-trivial character from qp to c times. And by this Pontryagin duality thing that I mentioned earlier, um, this is, these are all the, if I take these characters and I take their translates by elements of F, I get every character, all right? Um, so now given these characters, 
you define the Fourier transform the exact same way that you do in the classical setting. You just integrate against the character. So you define FV, which is actually depends on psi V to be the map from SFV to itself. It sends F to um, X maps to the integral F Y psi of X Y. Why. Okay, so you do it just the way that you do in the um, in, in the classical setting. You integrate against some um, character, and in fact, it's actually elementary to prove that the um, Fourier inversion holds in uh, in this setting for a unique choice of measure. Um, and just to sort of give you a sample computation of what's I mean, I told you that everything is a finite sum of characteristic functions. So if I tell you how to compute the Fourier expander, sorry, the Fourier transforms of characteristic functions, then you're, you're golden. So let me do that. So let's compute this Fourier transform. It's kind of, it's, Silly little computation. So it's the integral over P ZP um, psi of X Y psi bar of A X D Y, which is one over P to the K integral over ZP. Psi bar of a x dy. Okay. Now here's a nice, um, you know, if you haven't seen these things before, this is a nice exercise. Um, what do you get when you just take the 4a transform of the characteristic function for zp? Well, you just get zp itself. So in particular, this thing is one over p to the k psi bar of a x. 1zp xp to the k. Okay. Um, so just as happens, I mean, if you're used to working with the Fourier transform over the real numbers, I mean, you know that after you take, if you apply Poisson summation with um, over a uh, conjugacy or over some arithmetic progression, then it, it get it, its Fourier transform turns out to be some exponential function. And this is just reporting the same thing. Um, you know, if you don't follow this computation, then this is a good, also a good exercise. And another good exercise. Is to figure out what the Fourier transform, I mean, just convince yourself that this is true for if dx of ZP is equal to one. Um, okay, and I mean, you could also try to prove um, Fourier inversion in this setting. Okay, so for every place, we have a Fourier trend, we have a Schwartz space, we have a Fourier transform, um, but if we want to sort of do number theory with this thing, we really want to work over um, an Adela quotient, frankly. But we have one more step to get there, and that's to introduce the Adels. So the Adels of F are this restricted direct product FV Okay, so let me, because that got all, uh, maybe a lot. Oh. So what this says is that you take a, you take the direct product over all the FVs, take an XV that's in that direct product, and you declare that you want XV to be an integral element for almost every V, okay? Um, 
so it's useful to set the notation fs is the product over v and s of fb and af away from s is the product over all v not in s of fb so here um, order of s is, is finite and then what you do is you set the short space of af to be following space, okay, where this is just an algebraic tensor product. There's no completion here, all right? Um, and of course, if you have more than one infinite place, then the short space of F infinity is not the same as the algebraic tensor product of all the factors for the same reason as the short space of R squared is not the short space of R times short space of R. You have to take some completion. Um, okay, another way of writing this, well, let's, um, I guess I didn't say any way of writing this, so let's just define what this thing is. This is all locally constant, compactly supported F from the finite Adele's to C. And it's also the same thing as a restricted tensor product over V not dividing infinity of S of FB, um, which is, I mean, just to make it explicit, it's the span of pure tensors to perform products over all V not dividing infinity of FB, where FB is equal to the characteristic function of OB for almost every V. Okay. And so we again have a Fourier transform in this setting. So let's let um, psi from AF to C times be non-trivial. Um, and I'm going to assume that psi F, psi restricted to F embedded diagonally is one. So e.g. Um, if I took psi to be equal to psi infinity product over p psi p for, um, uh, if I take this following the trace from a e down to a q. Let me write that on a different line. Um, following trace from a f down to a q. So then this is, uh, this one is going to be trivial when you restrict it to F. Okay. Um, all right, and that's a good exercise if you wanted to do that. And we get a Fourier transform F psi, which is just the tensor product of the local Fourier transforms. Okay, so, I mean, in particular, if this is gonna make sense, you're gonna want, I mean, given the way that our short space is defined here, um, it's set up so that the, our test functions are equal to the characteristic function of OV for almost all places. So our Schwartz functions, our, our Fourier transform should preserve these um, O, uh, the characteristic functions of OV for almost all places. And, and that's indeed the case. So in particular, Whatever I choose for psi, f psi v of one o v is equal to one o v for almost every v. And all the, I mean, I guess I was scolded about this before. I should not say almost every, I guess I should say all but finitely many, or almost all. Okay. Um, all right. So in this setting, we have a version of Poisson summation. And I mean, for any F, that's a Schwartz function on AF, sum over X and F of F of X is the sum over X and F 
f psi f of x. Let's call this dagger. Um, and this is, in fact, equivalent to Poisson summation for the lattice. Um, OF inside F infinity. Okay. Um, and let me just remark that you have to normalize the Fourier transform um, to be self dual for psi for this thing to hold. And this is sort of, I mean, maybe it's an irritating technical point, but um, I mean, what does this mean? It means that, i.e., you want f to be equal to f hat hat negative x, so f of x. You want Fourier inversion to hold. And it's always going to hold up to a constant. The point is you have to normalize the harm measure um, in order to make it true on the nose. Um, and then the normalization is going to depend on your choice of character. Okay. Um, okay. So now for any vector space, we have the same theory. So let's just take V to be G A to the N and S B A F to be S V F infinity tensor S V A F away from infinity. Um, and we define it in an in analogy to what we did before. And if we're given a perfect pairing. BF, let's say, cross BF to F. And then um, we get out of this Fourier transform. Right, um, and we again have a Poisson summation formula. This setting. Right, um, and maybe just to sort of make a remark, um, if you're not used to these sorts of things, and this was sort of what. Uh, Earlier when there was this issue with um, D dividing M, I mean, you know, this was sort of what was uh, in the back of my mind. So the, in this expression, when you write sum over X and F of F of X, I mean, you should really be thinking that the sum is really supported, and this is true, it's really supported in uh, the integral point up to some finite amount. So if I write something like a sum over x in Q of f of x with um, f some Schwartz function on AQ, then this is actually supported in uh, Z times some N inverse for N big enough. All right, so these sums that are over, I mean, this looks like a sum over all f points, but really it's a sum over integral points and the Schwartz function is recording exactly how um, integrally you're requiring them to be plus some congruence conditions. And it's a very flexible language. Um, all right, so what's the adelic analog of what we started studying? So the adelic of our point counting thing of nx is, I'm just going to use the same notation because they actually reduce um, to the same thing in the case of q 
Q for suitable choices of F. It's the sum over C in B F of P C equals zero of F C over delta X, where delta have this sequence of maps. So I need to explain what I mean here. So I have my original map, which just takes my copy of R bigger than zero and puts it in coordinate wise in VR. Then R maps diagonally into F infinity. So for example, if you were looking at, um, I don't know, Q adjoin square D with uh, D bigger than zero, then you'd have two embeddings. You'd send your, your point your real number can go to um, like your a plus b squared d could go to um, a plus b squared d and then a minus b squared d. So there'd be these two real embeddings. And then you can place the infinite places of your vector space into, um, just set them into the adelic points of your vector space. And so this is our notion of height. This is how we record a, uh, a ball of some size. Um, be aware that the estimates will sort of uh, increase by a factor of the degree of the field extension in this. Um, so just as a one remark, um, if I take F to be equal to Q, um, F to be equal to F infinity, one a plus m v z hat, where z hat is just the product over all primes of z p. Then this thing, um, oh my god, already okay. So then n x is just equal to the sum over all c in b of z, such that C is congruent to A mod M. And I'll take A to be integral in this in this case. So A to B and B of C um, of F infinity C over delta X. Okay. So one thing to remark about this is that even though idyllic sums look the same, they're stronger. And this is what, let me say, or maybe more flexible. So what do I mean by this? Um, if, you're, if you find an estimate for this sum and x uh, up here, then for any for an arbitrary f, it's the same thing as finding an estimate for your circle method problem where you allow any congruence condition. Okay. And usually, I mean, people in their proofs, they, I mean, they effectively they'll work in all cases, right? But um, I mean, sometimes there's additional papers that are written to like deal with uh, adding a congruence condition of some size or other. But I mean, this sort of incorporates all congruence conditions at once. So it's a very flexible language, even over um, just the rational numbers. So there's a question here. Yeah. It, should there also be a restriction to the zero set of P in, in that sum? Ah, uh, yeah, here, right. Thank you. Let me just add it in here. Thank you. Okay. Um, because it doesn't fit well. Thank you. All right. All right. So I have I have ten minutes. So I think I can do the. Um, yeah. Okay. I might be able to do the um, the adelic version of the delta symbol, and then I can talk about the the conjectural business um, next time. So um, so here's the. Um, well, I guess we already had that as a tag. So.
So with, you know, once you've sort of seen the way that I set up the Delta symbol earlier, and you've seen some of this, this language, then it's sort of clear how one should uh, generalize it. So now I'm gonna take my Delta function. It's going to be a function from F to C. And it's of the form Delta M equals one if M equals zero and zero otherwise, all right? And so now we just do everything the same um, that we did before in the same manner, but uh, we just say everything is now idyllic. So I still have this embedding from R bigger than zero into F infinity of this diagonal embedding. Right, and so here's the idyllic delta symbol. Um, let phi be a Schwartz function now um, on two copies of the Adele's. I'm going to assume exactly the same things as I did last time. So t0 is equal to zero for all t in a f. And the Fourier transform in the second variable of zero and zero is not equal to zero. Um, then for q bigger than zero, um, sufficiently large, delta m is c q phi over q sum over delta in f times d m over d delta q d over delta q minus p delta over delta q um, and then the constant has the same property as before. One over phi two phi zero zero plus O N phi Q to the negative N. Okay, so this is my excuse for screwing this up earlier. My excuse for screwing this up earlier is that uh, here we do not need a divisibility condition on D. Okay. It's actually built into the, the statement of the theorem. Okay. Right? Um, so the proof is exactly the same as before. So you have sum over D in F times D of M over D delta Q, D over delta Q minus D over delta Q, sorry. D delta Q, um, which is zero if M equals zero and the sum over all D and F of phi of zero, D over delta Q if M is equal to zero, right? And just as it, before you use Poisson summation. Okay. So as applications, um, the estimate on even degree quadratic forms with the secondary term holds over number fields. Oh, okay. Um, right, it's just all the non-zero terms. So uh, Paul Nelson asks that uh, the error term degree of F over Q. Ah, wait, so for, I mean, I, for, okay. 
I mean, n is arbitrary, so sure, if you want to put it in, um, fine. Don't, oh, right, in the denominator? Ah, you might be right. Um, yeah, you might be right. You might have to put a, um, a degree term in here. Right, I think that's the only place it's gonna show up. Um, okay. Yeah, I think, so let me, um, okay, so let me just put um, a question. You can check the paper for this one. Because I think in the paper, I may have normalized things so that these, these um, delta Qs send it to um, Q to the, that D root. So thank you. So um, if this power might be wrong, um, it doesn't matter for, um, for this statement because it's just this error term. Um, did that answer the question? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, all right. So, um, and just let me emphasize again that, um, you know, since this is an idyllic, uh, I mean, when we were doing the estimate for these quadratic forms, and since we've worked idyllically, we've automatically incorporated congruence conditions into everything. Um, so, I mean, in this case, it actually gives some interesting. Um, oh, the okay, the idyllic version. Um, the idyllic version is not necessary to get the secondary terms. The idylliness, I mean. I mean, Thomas, for example, works completely classically in his, his paper. The, you know, the adelic version is uh, essentially there because you know, I wanted to apply this to some work on Langlands, um, the Langlands program and you sort of need to work adelically in order to, to make that application. And in addition, you know, it, it works very smoothly over, and uniformly over number fields. Um, more, let me also make the remark that um, and this is actually perfect because I can talk about the rest of this next time. Um, this uh, all works over function fields. There's, there's no change. I mean, the only thing you have to do is you have to pick what you want um, infinity to be, and then you pick your embedding in order to give a notion of size. Ah, so is there a chance the adelic version of generalized higher degree homogeneous polynomials? You're gonna, for this version, you're gonna run into the same problem that you do in the usual um, adelic circle method, I'm sorry, that you do in the usual delta method where it stops being helpful after you know degree three or something. Um, there's a paper of Patterson where he sets up some of the framework of the circle method adelically, but I don't, I mean, there's some things where it's not clear what to do. I, I think it's not entirely formal to, for the classical formulation of the circle method to, um, to phrase things adelically. Like the fairy dissection, I think is a bit, I, 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 I mean, I don't know how you'd set that up, for example. Oh. Um, Okay, so yeah, I mean, this is the uh, this is the endpoint for this lecture. So, um, so. Um.